incident reports are in fact available under the right to know law. Penn State, because it enjoys, along with Temple, Pitt, Lincoln, and uh, you know the, this exception, uh, they are not subject. Focusing in this moment on Penn State because of the Sandusky scenario, um, but uh, when when that situation occurred, it was the number one issue that uh, brought to the Office of Open Records the highest volume of requests and appeals related to that. None of that information uh, became available uh, under this right to know law. The cost of not having a Freedom of Information Act or a right to know law access, I would assert, is much greater than the cost that is associated. And there's definite costs, and we've talked about those before, commercial fees and things like that. I can tell you that there's a direct correlation between corruption and, uh, and poor right to know laws. If somebody is looking to fix 444 because they think it would prevent a Jerry Sandusky scandal, it, it wouldn't. You could have the strongest right to know law in the United States of America and those horrific crimes were still going to happen. The difference is that you might have found out a little earlier in this regard. And as, as the Deputy Director has often pointed out, something that I've missed regularly, we got right to know requests related to Penn State and the, and the Sandusky scenario. You didn't, we didn't know that at the time. <laughs> but in retrospect, when you look at these requests from the newspapers, they knew something was going on, but they immediately got dismissed out our door because Penn State wasn't covered. There may have been things that have could been done differently along the way to get it lots earlier. In terms of consequences, the longer somebody like um, Jerry Sandusky is out and about, unouted to the public, um, the, the more risk he poses uh, to the community. Well, timeliness is important in all criminal investigations. But it's especially important, it's especially important in child sexual abuse investigations. And why is that? That's because experience tells us and the research tells us that serial child molesters are significantly more likely than other offenders to continue their behavior, right? Even, even if they know that they're being investigated. So the comfort we might have in other investigations, uh, well, we haven't charged yet, uh, but the target knows we're investigating him, so he's unlikely to be continuing to offend. That does not necessarily apply when we're talking about these preferential serial child molesters. Even a highly successful final result does not mean that the investigation itself was a complete success, particularly when a serial child molester was left uh, uncharged for so long. Uh, senior leadership at the Office of Attorney General, uh, they had a line prosecutor who wanted to file charges. Uh, her bosses, though, up the chain of command, all believed that there were likely more victims out there. That was a premise from very early on, that this was not a single incident involving victim one, but that Sandusky hadn't fit the profile of somebody who was likely to have offended on many occasions with many victims. Um, so what happened in 2010, the decision, again, reasonable minds can differ about that decision whether to charge or not, but during the time that, um, uh, that they were considering the decision and for, for several months thereafter, there really was no concerted effort to go find more victims, and that's, and that's uh, puzzling um, in retrospect. That he could be victimizing? Yeah, I was worried about it, but it, it was a calculated risk. Two individuals indicated that they were abused by Sandusky in the fall of 2009.